Welcome to Generation Hope, a podcast by Connect.Faith. I'm Callie Bronkema, and this season we're having conversations over the topic of identity. I'll be having these conversations with a wide variety of young adults with a goal of building empathy and understanding between communities. So today I'm talking with Colin Crosby, a young professional working in New Jersey and a recent graduate from St. Lawrence University with a degree in psychology. Thanks for being here, Colin. Yes, thank you for having me, Callie. How's everything going today? Going great. I was hoping we could just start with you introducing yourself. Yeah, sounds good. Um, So everyone, my name is Colin Crosby. I am a young 24-year-old man. I use he, (laughs) him, his pronouns. Um, I'm currently living in New Jersey, which is the state that I was raised in, um, a little bit outside of Morristown, New Jersey. If anyone is familiar, have to give it a little bit of a shout out. Um, And I'm very excited to be here today. From time to time in the podcast this season, I'll be breaking the fourth wall and offering you some more context around the conversation that's happening. So, for example, you just heard Colin mention his pronouns. This has become a common practice in the LGBT community as it gives people the chance to tell you their gender identity instead of making an assumption based on their appearance. Quick reminder that gender identity is the personal sense of one's gender, and it might be different than the sex they were assigned at birth. I invited you here because we worked together at Camp Johnsonburg, and you kind of became known as the person who was really good at having tough conversations. Um, You're very good at staying calm, cool, and collected, and being able to empathize and really try your best to understand what someone is going through and i know a little bit came of that came from your time at saint lawrence and some of the training you had there um you were i know it's not called a resident advisor there it's called something else yes we call them community assistants which is basically the same thing as an ra so we call them cas instead and that's because we like to foster communities as opposed to just build residence halls I like that. So can you tell us a little bit about your training as a CA and um, how that helped you kind of better understand where people were coming from in your everyday life? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, definitely. Basically, within my role as a CA, a lot of our training really focused on not only the actual like policies that every resident has to follow, such as like where or where not people are allowed to drink or party, um, but also just how to really foster community, like I said at the beginning. And so a lot of our trainings really focused on getting to know and figuring out how to get to know individuals on a very personal level, while also trying to, you know, make sure they feel acclimated and welcomed and Uh, accustomed to the St. Lawrence community. So for those of you who don't know, St. Lawrence University is a very, very small liberal arts college in way upstate New York. I always describe it, it's about two hours above Syracuse, New York, an hour and a half east of Ottawa and two hours south of Montreal. And it's about 30 minutes from the Canadian border. So it's very much up there and it's a very different climate and culture than a lot of people are used to from wherever they're coming from, whether it be in the United States, throughout or abroad. And so a lot of the role as a CA is really making sure that you're able to connect with individuals so see how they can fit in and bring their own selves to St. Lawrence University and really figure out where it is that they may fit in and where they can find new friendships and really start to explore their identity and really focus on themselves. So I like what you just said, bring your own self to St. Lawrence, right? Because mm-hmm. when, I don't know, when I was 18, I don't know if I knew who my own self was, mm-hmm. but I wanted a place where I could figure that out. So in your time as a CA and as a unit coordinator and counselor at Johnsonburg, and then just as a person, um, what have you seen be important for people as they try to figure out who like what does that mean for me who Mm -hmm. really is my true self that i want to present to the world yeah absolutely and i think what you said at the beginning of you know you go into college at 18 years old you don't really know who you are and you know 
I'm 24 now going on 25 and heck, I don't know who I am now either. And I think yeah. that's a question that we tend to wrestle with throughout our lives. And, you know, it's somewhat comforting, but also very concerning at times to kind of wrestle with that. Um, so I think that, you know, bringing your own self to college or to whatever community is basically just really figuring out where you find the confidence in being who you are, as well as, you know, learning a little bit more about yourself and what you may like or what you don't like. And I think something that's really important for people, and I know it was incredibly important for me and why I chose to go to a four-year college as opposed to studying at a community college firsthand, was not only because I had the privilege and the resources to be able to go to a four-year college and university, um, but I know that I needed that space to kind of take a step away and be away from my family and away from the people who I knew and I grew up with for the past 18 years of my life and I needed a space that was Collins. I needed a space that was my own. And I think that's something that's really important for individuals as they're trying to figure out their identity. And I recognize that it's not an opportunity that a lot of people are able to be given. And for those who are, it's given to, you may not be tapping into that kind of resource as well. So I don't necessarily mean, in, you know, is specifically a college community, but just finding a space where you can feel yourself and be your authentic self. So I think like a little bit about that is, you know, when I was in senior in high school, that's when I first came out to my parents and my family and my friends as gay. And so for me, it did take like a little bit longer than some other individuals. You know, some people come out when they're 13, 12, 14 years old now, even younger, which is amazing. Um, but, you know, I didn't really have that confidence and that comfort level to do so until senior year of high school. And even then, I kind of look back on it and, you know, I definitely see myself as putting on a little bit of like a mask or maybe not so necessarily a mask, but a facade that wasn't necessarily who I was. I think that, you know, a lot of the influence that I had was like different YouTube celebrities or other celebrities, which are these hyper feminized, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but hyper feminized individuals, you know, you see that caricature portrayed across a lot of different types of like media. And I think that I kind of really tapped into that. You know, I really just wanted to tap into what people thought was, you know, the gay best friend and where you could make friendships in high school. And then as I progressed in my time at St. Lawrence, a lot of that was figuring out how to take my identity from being gay at the forefront to, yes, I am gay, but Colin, what else do we have going on here? Who else are you as an individual? You know, you got to have a hobby or something in there. One of the opportunities that I had with um, becoming a CA and was being able to sit down with our Dean of Diversity and being able to sit down with our Dean of Diversity and Inclusion, who went, ran us through an awareness training that really focused on trying to figure out your identity and recognizing how other people's identities are not the same as yours. And so the first part of this was explaining the difference between social identities and personal identities. And so social identities, it's often referred to as like the big eight. Those big eight identities are race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, ability, religion slash spirituality, nationality, and socioeconomic status. Generally those in that category of like yeah. broader identities that are part of a bigger group and can be seen by a bigger group. Um, but whereas personal identities are exactly that, they're personal to you, they're personal identifiers. So that was, those are things such as, you know, I identify as a student, I identify as a wife, I identify as, you know, a volunteer or a collaborator or any of these other types of like personal characteristics that we kind of like to describe ourselves as. A leader is always a very good one that I like to think of. Um, where there isn't this whole bigger category that can be, has one specific connection, but they're personal to you. And at the same time of being able to try to distinguish between a social identity and a personal identity is also a primary and a secondary identity. Hmm. And so a primary identity is one that's constantly at your forefront. Like as you enter new spaces, what identity am I thinking of and how am I identifying as? And your secondary identity is one that is equally as important to you, but may take that background step or that back. Back seat. Backseat, exactly. So it's a it's an identity that takes that backseat and it isn't always present at the front of your mind. And something that's really important that I never really kind of recognized prior to this training was 
your primary identity and your secondary identity can be changing and can be flipping. Mm. And so for me, I kind of thought about it. And, you know, at one point in my life, talking to like senior year of high school, being gay was a very primary part of my identity. That was something that I always was thinking about, you know, was thinking about prior to coming out. It was something that, you know, as I entered new spaces, like, okay, I'm gay and I'm entering this space. How is that going to affect me? How am I going to affect the environment Mm. around me? Mm -hmm. You know, to what level do I want to express this? There's so many factors that go into how someone might feel entering a space. Fear of discrimination, pressure to conform to social norms, a worry that you're the only one in that space who holds this identity, and you don't know how the people in that room will react. So the next time you enter a new space, maybe it's going to dinner or the office, I challenge you to pause for a second and consider if you feel any nervousness entering that space and how you might feel if you were a member of a different community entering that space. And whereas like a secondary characteristic for me was like age, I never really thought about, you know, how old I was, you know, I obviously took a look around and thought, okay, like, I may be, you know, on par with other people in the room or maybe younger or maybe older, but it wasn't something I was thinking about right away. But then, you know, as I got older, I realized that being gay for me was more of a secondary identity for me. And it was something that, you know, I carry with me and I'm able to express and I carry, I always know it's there, but it's not something that I constantly think about, you know, like going into the grocery store, like, are these people looking at me, Hmm. you know, walking down the street with my boyfriend, you know, that's a situation where, you know, I do think about that if we decide to like hold hands. Um, And it's kind of points to that, how secondary and primary identities can kind of be in the state of flux. And it's not necessarily any specific one, and it's changing for everyone. So how either in your life personally, or just what you've observed um, in your time as a CA, um, how have you seen people struggle with the idea of the world expects me to, to fit into this mold, and I'm trying to figure out for myself how I fit in? Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think I saw it in less as a CA, but more in terms of like the individuals that I became friends with and interacted with around me. Um, You know, there was always this um, kind of certain level of like, okay, like I am a student, I'm at St. Lawrence, I'm here to study. But you know, what else am I contributing to the world? And how else am I interacting to the world? And you know, the amount of conversations I had that are just like, absolutely so amazing that I was able to have that opportunity about from all these different individuals from all across the world, you know, talking about their experiences and how they're interacting with St. Lawrence and how it's so vastly different. You know, I was a 18 to 21, 22 year old white man. Uh, You know, I was gay, but like I was a white man. So I was able to kind of very move very freely throughout St. Lawrence University, which is a predominantly white institution. And so I was talking to my peers, you know, who were people of color or international And, you know, they just interacted so differently. And Mm -hmm. I was so important for me to kind of see that and to hear that and to hear, you know, like, yes, I had that opportunity to kind of really find myself and to kind of delve into St. Lawrence and become a part of the um, spectrum, which was our LGBTQ social and advocacy club um, and really be able to have a part of programming in that. But then also, you know, taking on a couple jobs, but then I was speaking to my peers and they're like, oh, I don't really have that much time. I really need to focus on, you know, academics because they're there on like on much stricter scholarships. And so they need to dedicate a lot more time to that. Whereas, you know, I had my scholarships, but they're pretty easy to maintain. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, for me, if I didn't have those scholarships, yes, it would have impacted my ability to go to St. Lawrence, but not to the degree at certain individuals around me. And I think that's kind of where I saw it the most of people being able to find themselves as to, you know, what degree of freedom did they have even when they're in these spaces to kind of interact and with the world and take on the resources around them. Mm -hmm. Um, I also saw it, you know, at Camp Johnsonburg where we both worked at, you know, and those campers. So those were definitely younger kids. Those were, you know, six years old to seniors in high school. Um, So 17, 18 years old. And, you know, specifically like thinking about interacting with like those middle schoolers or those young high schoolers or even high schoolers who are just kind of like 
starting to figure things out about themselves and, you know, them being able to see, you know, queer people at camp. You heard Colin use the umbrella term queer people. The word queer has a tense past and used to be used often as a derogatory term. But recently, it's been reclaimed by some in the LGBT community to be an umbrella term for people who are not heterosexual or cisgender. I distinctly remember, you know, I had a couple individuals come up to me and just be like, oh, I like your bracelet. And it's like my St. Lawrence University, like pride bracelet, which was rainbow on it. And I was like, oh yeah, like I got it at like my college's pride. And then that opens up the conversation to be able right. to be like, oh, can you tell me like, you know, whether that they may be coming out to me or telling me about their experience currently or, you know, their experience with their families or what their interactions may be. It's so interesting to see, you know, the level of like that first kind of like light bulb going off of like, oh, this is a possibility for me. Like, this is a life that like, you know, I can live. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's also very cool too. Based on the experiences that you have had, um, are there any kind of common things that you find are just really key in helping a person either come to terms more quickly and be more confident in their identity or things that might hinder that process of figuring out who who they are, who their authentic, authentic self is. Yeah, definitely. So I think that's something speaking to hindering first is, you know, mental health, of course, like you have to be, you know, fulfilling those basic needs first and, you know, mm. was it Maslow or whoever, should know this psych major um, hierarchy of needs hierarchy of needs you need to be set <laughs> settling those first um but you know you need to be able to be yourself and to be able to have that freedom to kind of explore and express yourself and i think that the first part of that is just being in a place where you're able to have those deeper conversations with yourself and mm. be able to kind of do that deep thinking and that soul searching that we talk about a lot that it's hard and it's not fun a lot of the time um, so I think that's definitely something that can kind of impact you is to kind of, you know, to what degree are you letting yourself have these kind of internal conversations and internal struggle? And if it is becoming too much of a struggle, do I have resources that I can tap into to be able to make it less of a struggle and to get the resources that I need to really start thinking for myself and bettering myself and bettering my mental health too? So I think that that's first and foremost, like, you know, if you need to put your oxygen mask on first and figure things out and get the help that you need, and then through that, be able to start to figure out your identity and figure out how you want to express that identity furthermore, absolutely, you, it's an important step for things that can really help you to become your more authentic self. Um, I think back to, you know, my friends growing up and my friends, and I think a lot of other queer people can kind of relate to this where it's you kind of get to a point where you know i didn't know it at the time but a lot of my friends i had were also going through the same struggle mm. specifically talking about like queer identities and you know i had a great group of friends who we really allowed ourselves to kind of be who we wanted to be and there was no judgment and there was no kind of like oh well you need to act like this or you need to go do do this thing because we're doing it too it was a lot of just like oh like this is fun let's do it so you know, of course, we delved really deep, too deep into Harry Potter and, <laughs> you know, found our little niches of escape. Um, but we also always had each other to come back to. And then as we got older, we kind of just started you know, coming out to each other. Um, and I remember like my one friend came out well before a lot of us and she was great resources that I had. And so making sure you're, again, tapping into those resources. And so really the friends around you can really help you kind of be the individual you want to be. I think a lot of, you know, parents say it and, you know, other professionals of like kids may say it is like, you know, you are who you are, the people like you surround yourself with and you allow yourself mm -hmm. to be with and, you know, taking a look around to be like, are these people, people who are going to allow me to be my authentic self? And do I feel comfortable expressing that here? And I think, you know, a lot of people will find that like, yes, these are the people who I can be my authentic self with. But then sometimes, you know, you may have others that really are going to start to hinder you, especially as you start to get older. Um, and I think other aspects that could really help you kind of 
be your most authentic self is really just trying to figure out ways to like be confident you know i did not have the confidence that i have now until you know i went to summer camp you know i think about it a lot I went to like a seven week sleepover summer camp away from my family and friends and away from technology. And so I was able to just hang out with the same group of 60 boys. And so I was able to just really just like be myself and not have to worry about anything. And I think allowing yourself that opportunity of just like having a space that's going to promote your confidence and to really kind of boost who you are as an individual and then tapping into that confidence and, you know, kind of shying away that voice in the back of your head that's like, oh, don't act like that or don't do that because then the people are going to think you're this. I think it's just important to just like have that confidence to be like, I'm doing this and I'm doing it this way. And it's not because of this reason. It's not because of this social identity that I have. And I think that's really important as well. Yeah. Is there anything else that you wanted to tell us about your personal journey in kind of self-acceptance? So, I mean, I've already touched upon it a lot, but, you know, I come from a very, like, very fortunate and privileged background. You know, my family, they, I had their support since the moment I came out and I continued to have their support. And as well as the friends I surrounded myself with was a very, very, loving and really allowed you to be who you can be and I think for me that really impacted in you know my ability to come out and to be the individual who I really want to be I think that really when it came down to it the only reason I waited so long is because I just wasn't ready I just wasn't ready to kind of have that part of myself and you know there were you know middle school is rough for everyone it's not always (laughs) the best Um, and so I think that you know definitely having those moments can hinder you and can kind of make you take a step back. But I think it's also important to recognize that you need to take your journey as you can. And, you know, my boyfriend, he didn't come out until he was 25 or so years old. And, you know, there are people who are coming out 10 years prior to that. And I think it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter when you feel that you're able to step into the shoes that you want to fill. But once you're there to just kind of strut your stuff and make it happen. Mm -hmm. We touched a little bit earlier on the idea of some of the stereotypes and expectations that come with different communities, that come with identifying as gay or being in the LGBT community. Um, And it's kind of like there's this box and this mold that you're now expected to fit into. You talked a little bit about how you didn't feel like you necessarily fit into all parts of that mold. So how do you reconcile with, you know, trying to say, this is who I am. I'm proud of my community. I'm proud of being in this community, but also I don't, you know, necessarily fit within every stereotype that we Mm -hmm. see in the media about what this community is. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's something that's really tough to do because a lot of the times you're inundated with similar caricatures of specific individuals. And I think, you know, within 2021, we are starting to kind of step away from this and we're seeing a lot more different types of characters from different types of social groups. Um, But, you know, I'm thinking specifically, you know, when I was growing up, when I was coming out, you know, uh, a lot of the big gay characters were like Cam and Mitch on Modern Family and then Kurt on Glee. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, while these are perfectly valid ways of, you know, being gay, it doesn't entirely make up who I was as an individual. And so, you know, while I do think of myself as a pretty feminine individual, um, and, you know, I love to say yes and whatnot within those specific spaces, like, I think that it wasn't who I was across the board. And yes, it kind of I think that the struggle that I had was I played into that a lot. And, you know, Mm. I really did try to be that kind of caricature. And I found that people liked it and people were able to kind of like understand it because it was a caricature that they saw uh, within TV. And so they were able to be like, oh, okay, like he acts like that. That's like this. I'm familiar with this identity. And I think that, you know, A, it's important to recognize that everyone is able to be who they are and to encapsulate a certain identity in their own individual way, which is, you know, a lot of the conversation we're having is about. Um, But I think in order to step away from it is recognizing that you can have that part of it that you own, but then also 
you don't have to own all of it and your love of axe throwing is equally as valid as your love of sewing within the same (laughs) individual you know Mm -hmm. things that are specifically entwined to specific genders you know can all exist within whoever and you know a lot of my conversation is really focusing on you know queer identity and gay identity and it's really not too much focusing on you know other types of identities but that's you know where i see myself one thing that i've heard you mention just in our prior conversations is that this i is this idea that um parts of the lgbt culture like you just mentioned you say yes and like queen and things like that um are then adopted by people who do not identify as LGBT and they suddenly become more acceptable to, um, to either whether it's saying something or wearing something, um, and that that can be, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I imagine it can be frustrating when, when you see that happening, uh, in media or, just in real life. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So, you know, thinking back on that, I think it's, you know, first of all, like important to recognize that a lot of like that kind of like verbiage, such as like, yes, or queen or um, shade or anything like that. A lot of that stems from specifically like queer culture, but a lot of like black and um, ball culture that really originated within, um, correct me if I'm wrong world, but like, 60s, 70s kind of era. Ball culture or ballroom culture refers to a subculture of the drag community that was created by Black and Latinx LGBT individuals. Because drag competitions often excluded those groups due to their race, underground ball culture was created in the 1960s to provide a safe space for queer youth of color to express themselves freely. Because most of those youths were kicked out of their homes due to their sexuality or gender identity, small family groups called houses were created, and they would compete with each other during the ball competitions. If you want to see this represented in media and learn more about ballroom culture, check out the TV show Pose or the show Legendary. The frustrations that I may feel about people kind of reacting to me in specific ways or wanting to interact with me and talk with me and relate to me in specific ways, such as through like Tyler Oakley, a YouTuber who I do love and I adore. Um, (laughs) But other types of, you know, common queer mannerisms or anything like that is nothing I feel compared to, you know, I'm sure original members of these communities where it actually originated in. And so I think, first of all, like it's important to recognize that. I think an equally as important part of, you know, recognizing that while people may be trying to re- relate to you in specific ways and using different parts of pop culture, you know, they may have watched RuPaul's Drag Race once, like, and be starting to bring that verbiage kind of into me because they know I'm gay and I do watch RuPaul's Drag Race. I think that you also need to recognize, you know, all right, like, let's think about this and, you know, where may have this originated from? Like, uh, do I have any kind of ownership over this? Like, do I have any over- ownership over this identity? And it's like, no, there's a lot of different things that impact it and impact the way that cultures are kind of brought into the world. And I think that what we're learning, especially within, you know, 2021, 2020, is how can I kind of, as an individual, recognize these parts of culture that, you know, I may be bringing into my life and maybe consuming, but do I know everything and do I know the history and am I able to respect, you know, mm-hmm. the origination of like all these different things, yeah. um, which is a really, you know, elaborate and roundabout way of being like, you know, making sure you're recognizing cultural appropriation versus, appreci- versus appreciation and, you know, also recognizing are there specific stereotypes and caricatures that people are trying to portray onto you as an individual and press upon you? And how can I kind of free myself of that weight? Yeah, it all it all seems to be coming back to this idea, right, of how can I be my most authentic self? Um, like you just said, freeing all of the expectations that people put on you and really digging down to your core and saying, 
where are the parts of me that I'm proud of or that I want to be proud of someday? The things that make me happy, the things that make me feel good about myself. And how can I not only build that up in myself, but present that version of myself to the world? So if there are, is anybody out there listening who is struggling with finding that most authentic form of themselves, what would you want to say to them? Hmm. I think to anyone who's kind of like going through that struggle or experiencing that struggle of trying to figure out who they are and how to best um, bring that to the forefront, I think it's just important to recognize that like everything you may enjoy and everything you may love about yourself and that people don't necessarily see are so valid. And I think that it's important that you first need to kind of have that conversation with yourself of being like, yes, I'm okay about this. Yes, I love this about myself. Yes, this is amazing thing that I can do. And I think that once you kind of start to build yourself up and express gratitude towards yourself and express confidence in who you are, you know, do that to yourself first, like do that in your own spaces, whether it be in your room at home and your specific group of friends. Um, and then from there, trying to figure out how I can help that permeate into wider spaces into how can I make sure that the individual who I want to be in, you know, my bedroom is the same individual that's walking down the street or going into Gap or getting smoothies with my friends. I think that's something that's important that I always thought to myself was something I learned from summer camp is that life begins at the end of your comfort zone. And it's often described as your comfort zone being a hula hoop. You have your hula hoop that's around yourself and that's the space that you feel most comfortable in. And outside of that hoop, outside of that hula hoop is um, activities or things that, you know, make you pretty uncomfortable, but you don't want to do yet. You know, don't focus about trying to take huge leaps outside of your hula hoop. Just focus on taking a step outside your hula hoop. Maybe for instance, it's going from the shallow end to the deep end of the pool. Um, But once you find that you kind of first put that step out and you find that, okay, like I can do that. Like that's something I can do. And your hula hoop gets bigger. And it's just constantly trying to make those steps to make your hula hoop bigger and figuring out where in this comfort zone I feel, you know, able to, take a step out and to explore a little bit more about yourself, settle with that, keep the confidence and being who you are, and then expanding it from there. So what is giving you hope right now? I think something that's giving me hope right now is just understanding, and this may be daunting for some, but for me, I do find hope and comfort in it, is that, you know, there's always a new day and time is going to keep ticking and things are going to keep moving And there may be periods where you may be feeling like there's nothing to hope for. There's nothing good going on right now. There's all these things happening in the world. And I feel so overwhelmed by the weight of it that like nothing is good. And I think that it's really easy to kind of get worked up into that. But I think something that really does give me hope is that while there may be, you know, a lot of things happening in the world or a lot of things happening in your world that's impacting you as an individual potentially negatively, you know, you're able there's always the next day. There's always something to look forward to. And I think it's just figuring out those moments and, you know, perhaps taking it week by week or year by year is too much and taking it by day by day, meal by meal. That's all you need to do. Yeah. The sun will always come up in the morning, right? Exactly. Yeah. So my second question for you is what do you hope for? And you can take that on the smallest scale you want or the biggest scale you want. But Mm -hmm. just generally, what do you hope for? I think that's something that I hope for is to never lose my ability to kind of be inquisitive and learn more about myself and explore Mm -hmm. who I am as an individual. And, you know, while I've already had a great deal of, you know, identity and soul searching um, that a lot of other individuals don't really face until later in life, because I've had the impact of, you know, I've had the experience of growing up queer. Um, I think that, you know, I really, I really hope that I don't lose that. And I really hope that, you know, as I grow in my life and, you know, potentially become a dad one day, I'm able to pass that on to my kids as well. And I think so that's something that I really hope for is to always keep that part of myself of, you know, searching in terms of who do I, how do I fit in as an individual into the spaces around me and 
how do I best make sure that that's the most authentic self that I can make it be? Well, I'm very excited to see you continue to find your most authentic self and keep questioning things because it makes me question things too. And when you surround yourself by inquisitive people, it, it makes you better. So this has been Generation Hope by Connect.Faith. I'm Callie Brankova, and thank you for listening. We did it! Woo! <laughs> All right.